I wonder if lowering the numbers of what's considered high blood pressure has anything to do with saving more lives? Or is it more about selling more medications? Over the past few decades, we've seen the threshold for what's considered healthy blood pressure continue to drop, and it raises important questions. Has this really helped us live longer, healthier lives? Or have we become more medicated and more anxious about numbers that might not be as dangerous as we've been led to believe? Let's take a step back and look at how blood pressure guidelines have evolved since the 1970s. At that time, high blood pressure was generally considered to be anything over 160 over 95 millimeter of mercury. Fast forward to today, and the latest guidelines have brought that number down to 120 over 80 millimeter of mercury. Now, millions more people fall under the category of hypertensive. What's behind this constant tightening of the belt on blood pressure? Are we really saving more lives? Or have we just created a society where a bigger chunk of the population is now considered sick? Back in the 1970s, the medical community viewed blood pressure quite differently than we do today. High blood pressure, what doctors call hypertension, was considered a serious issue, but it wasn't diagnosed as frequently. If you had a systolic reading, the top number of 160, or a diastolic reading, the bottom number of 95, you were considered hypertensive. At the time, the focus was on the most severe cases, and people with moderately elevated numbers were often told to exercise, lose weight, or eat less salt. By the 1990s, the threshold for diagnosing high blood pressure had dropped to 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. This became the standard cutoff for many years. At this point, millions more people were considered to have hypertension. The reasoning was clear. Data suggested that lowering blood pressure, even by a few points, could reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes. But did lowering the threshold actually make us healthier, or did it just put more people on lifelong medications? The guidelines shifted again in 2017, when the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association made a dramatic change. Suddenly, blood pressure readings of 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury or higher were considered high which meant that nearly half of all American adults now fell under the hypertensive category. Just like that, millions more were added to the list of people who might need medications to manage their blood pressure. But what does that say about the accuracy of the science behind these numbers? Are these new guidelines truly reflective of what's best for the population, or are they influenced by other interests? When the new 120 over 80 guideline was introduced, it was based on data that suggested lower blood pressure could reduce the risk of cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. Studies like the SPRINT trial were particularly influential, showing that more aggressive treatment in high-risk individuals led to better outcomes. But were these findings being applied too broadly? Many doctors were concerned that this new guideline would medicalize an even larger portion of the population especially older adults who naturally have higher blood pressure as part of aging. Have we crossed a line where we're treating millions of people with medications they might not actually need? Are the risks of lowering blood pressure too much being overlooked? When blood pressure guidelines are lowered, it's not just a matter of getting more people on medications. It also changes how we think about health. Now, more people are walking around thinking they're sick. In fact, with the new guidelines, nearly half of all American adults are technically hypertensive. If we keep lowering these thresholds, will there come a point where we're all considered to have high blood pressure? But beyond the psychological toll of being told you're unhealthy, there's the issue of overtreatment. Lowering blood pressure in people who are only mildly hypertensive, say someone with a reading of 140 over 85, might not carry as much benefit as it does for someone with a reading of 160 over 100. But these people are still given medications, and medications come with risks. Are we really striking the right balance between treatment and prevention? Do you find this video interesting so far? Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Hit the like button and ring notification bell if you want to see more content just like this one. Let's shift our focus for a moment to something that's not often discussed. The way blood pressure is measured in a doctor's office. How many times have you rushed into your appointment, sat down, and had a nurse immediately slap on the blood pressure cuff? Maybe you were running late, stressed out, or just had a coffee right before the appointment. All of these factors can lead to higher readings, and yet doctors often rely on these single readings to diagnose high blood pressure. In reality, blood pressure can fluctuate throughout the day, depending on a variety of factors like stress, sleep, and physical activity. 
Even something as simple as how you're sitting during the test can affect the result. If your arm isn't supported, or if your feet aren't flat on the floor, it can give a falsely high reading. So how many people are being told they have high blood pressure based on inaccurate measurements? Some doctors are now advocating for home blood pressure monitoring, which can give a more accurate picture of a person's true blood pressure over time. But this isn't standard practice yet. Shouldn't we be more cautious about how we measure blood pressure before we decide someone needs lifelong medication? By the way, check our next video on the blood pressure measuring mistakes you should avoid. Another important point to consider is whether we're addressing the root causes of high blood pressure or just treating the symptoms. For many people, lifestyle changes like improving diet, exercising regularly, reducing stress, and quitting smoking can make a big difference. But when the focus is on medication, these lifestyle interventions often take a back seat. Think about it. When you visit your doctor, how often do they talk to you about the importance of diet and exercise compared to how often they talk about medications? Are we too quick to hand out prescriptions without giving people the tools they need to make lasting changes in their health? In a world where medications are readily available, have we lost sight of the simple but powerful steps we can take to lower blood pressure naturally? And more importantly, are doctors and healthcare systems doing enough to promote these changes? Let's also think about how these guidelines affect older adults. As we age, our arteries naturally stiffen and blood pressure tends to rise. This doesn't necessarily mean that an 80-year-old with blood pressure of 140 over 85 is in danger. In fact, aggressively lowering blood pressure in older adults can lead to dangerous side effects like dizziness, falls, and even kidney damage. So why are we so eager to push medications on older adults when the risks might outweigh the benefits? Are we truly improving their quality of life or are we putting them at risk for unnecessary complications? Finally, we can't ignore the financial implications of lowering blood pressure thresholds. More people being diagnosed with hypertension means more prescriptions, more doctor visits, and more healthcare costs. This creates a financial burden, not just on individuals, but on healthcare systems as a whole. Should we be spending these resources on treating mild elevations in blood pressure? Or could the money be better spent elsewhere? like on public health initiatives that focus on prevention through diet and exercise. Ultimately, it's time to rethink our approach to blood pressure management. We need to focus on accurate measurements, individualized treatment, and lifestyle changes that can help prevent high blood pressure in the first place. The numbers on the blood pressure cuff shouldn't define our health. Instead, we should aim for a more balanced approach that promotes true well-being without turning the entire population into patients. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and see you on the next one.